Good morning, church. Uh, coming to you from way over here this first Sunday morning of New Year's. Happy New Year's. I haven't seen you since last year. Usually, I guess it's a funny joke this year. It's kind of sad, but hope to actually get to see your face um, sooner rather than later. That is, of course, our prayer. We do appreciate all of your prayers. Um, we were there for us way over here. We are all slowly and surely recovering, uh, headed out of the woods as far as our illness goes. And I appreciate Ronnie for picking up the uh, sermon last week to give me a bit of a break. Um, so we do love you guys and appreciate you guys. Let's go ahead and jump in. Today is um, a combination of things as far as it goes. It is the second Sunday of Christmas. Christmas is, you will remember, in the historical church, not a day that consists of December 25th, but is a season that starts on December 25th and goes for 12 days. Um, so we're still in the Christmas season, still talking about Jesus coming to earth and his birth. But it is also the Sunday before Epiphany. Epiphany is this week. Epiphany is when the church marks the arrival of the wise men, the Magi, in Matthew chapter 2. And so we're going to kind of do a combination of both of those things because, of course, they're related. Um, even though you will recollect that the wise men come sometime after the birth of Jesus, this isn't the sort of thing that happens on the night Jesus was born but thematically they're related. And I want to start just by um, reading Matthew chapter 2. And uh, it's a bit of a long one, but we're going to kind of hit the highlights of the entire chapter today, not in any exhaustive way, but just give us some things to think about. So Matthew chapter 2, starting out, um, is what we'll be looking at today. These, this is the word of the Lord. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the territory of Judea during the rule of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. And they asked, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east. We've come to honor him. And when King Herod heard this, he was troubled, and everyone in Jerusalem was troubled with him. He gathered all the chief priests and the legal experts and asked them where the Christ was to be born. And they said, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what the prophet wrote. You, Bethlehem, land of Judah, by no means are you least among the rulers of Judah, because from you will come one who governs, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and found out from them the time when the star had first appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you found him, report to me, so that I may too go and honor him. When they heard the king, they went and looked. The star they had seen in the east went ahead of, him, of them until it stood over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother. And falling to their knees, they honored him. Then they opened their treasure chest and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, because they, uh, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Because they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they went back to their own country by another route. And when the Magi had departed, an angel from the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up and take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod will soon search for the child in order to kill him. And Joseph got up and during the night took the child and his mother to Egypt. And he stayed there until Herod died. And this fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet, I have called my son out of Egypt. And when Herod knew the Magi had fooled him, he grew very angry. He sent soldiers to kill all the male children in Bethlehem and in all the surrounding territory who were two years old and younger, according to the time that he had learned from the Magi. This fulfilled the words spoken through Jeremiah the prophet. A voice was heard in Ramah weeping and much grieving, Rachel weeping for her children, and she did not want to be comforted because they were no more. And after King Herod died, an angel from the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up, the angel said, and take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. Those who are trying to kill the child are dead. Joseph got up and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus ruled over Judea in the place of his father Herod, Joseph was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he went to the area of Galilee. He settled in a city called Nazareth so that what was spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. 
the way we read the Bible is a subjective thing. It um, is shaped by where we are when we read the Bible. A number of years ago, a couple of uh, Bible teachers, professors of New Testament ran an experiment. They uh, gathered their class first in the United States and read to them the parable of the prodigal son. And after reading the parable of the prodigal son, encouraging their class to listen to the parable closely, they asked a simple question. They said, um, when the prodigal son was off in the far country, why was he hungry? And in the American context, uh, the vast majority of those who answered the question in their class said, well, he was hungry because he had wasted his resources. He took his inheritance from his father ahead of time. He went off and he wasted it on doing things that he shouldn't do, so he didn't have anything left to buy food with, and that's why he was hungry. It's right there, they said, in the text. It's what the Bible says. And this uh, group of teachers, they um, taught a variety of situations around the world. So next they went to Russia and they taught the same class. They ran the same experiment. They read the parable of the prodigal son. They encouraged the class to listen carefully to what it said. They asked the same question. Why was the younger son hungry? And the vast majority of those who answered the question in a Russian context said, well, it's right there in the text. The Bible's super clear about what it means. He was hungry because there was a famine in the land. Didn't you read your Bible? And of course, in a Russian context, this was in the years after the fall of the Soviet Union, they were a people that were familiar with famines. Things like that are things that we Americans very rarely have to think about or deal with or accept the reality of, but they did. And so because of their context and their situation, this was the sort of thing that stuck out to them. The Bible clearly says he was hungry because there was a famine. And then later they uh, were teaching a class in South Africa and they decided to do the same experiment there. They read the parable encouraging the class to listen closely to what the parable had to say. They asked the same question. Why was the younger son hungry? And uh, the class, the vast majority of them who answered the question said, it's clear the Bible says obviously so that the young man was hungry because in that far land when he had nothing else no one would share their food with him haven't you read your bible uh, and of course they come from a culture that values hospitality above above um, most other things and so what they demonstrated was in their experiment reading it here and there and South Africa and Russia and other places that, depending on where you came from, different things stuck out from you in the text. All of those things were in the Bible. All of those were technically correct answers, but depending on where you came from in your life experiences, that shaped which parts of the Bible jumped out. And this sort of thing happens in the Christmas story, too. This sort of thing happens in Matthew chapter 2. Surrounded by all of uh, the comforts we tend to have in Christmas, um, in our life in general at Christmas time, we, we oftentimes find that our way of looking at the Christmas story is shaped by forces outside of the Bible um, more than they are forces inside of the Bible. And so we are influenced by Christmas songs. And so we have that thing that goes around Facebook every year. You do realize that the Bible never says that there were three wise men, nor were they kings, because we learned that from the song, not the Bible, We Three Kings of the Orient are. Um, we are shaped by the sentiment and the spirit of our culture at Christmas time, shaped by things like Hallmark movies or Norman Rockwell or Thomas Kincaid or Christmas cards that uh, convey sentiments about what Christmas is supposed to be. And in these Christmas cards, we very rarely see anything outside of the Magi showing up in Matthew chapter 2 appear in our consciousness. When was the last time you saw a Christmas card depicting the slaughter of the innocents as a part of the Christmas story? And so coming from our position where Christmas is about warm fuzzies, where it's about sentiment, where it is about uh, sweet baby Jesus, it's easy enough for us to miss the powerful, subversive, message that text like Matthew chapter 2 brings to us. And a helpful exercise might be in order to miss some of those things that others might pick up that we might miss because of where we sit. A helpful exercise might be to ask how the story might be read through someone else's eyes. 
through someone's eyes who isn't comfortable, through someone's eyes who isn't sitting on top of the pile, as it were, as we tend to be in America, what, what would it look like to read through someone else's eyes? And if we begin to read particularly, for instance, through the eyes of someone a little bit lower down in that pile of human standing and human circumstance and the way life goes, we begin to see a very different sort of story emerge from the Christmas story than the one that we are used to. It is still good news. It is still joy to the world. The angel's proclamation in the Gospel of Luke holds no less true. It is no lesser reason to celebrate, but those reasons begin to take on uh, nuance and different dynamics and a depth that we oftentimes miss. It speaks to the revolutionary nature of what God is doing in the world, and it is a, a challenge. It is an affront to the church to join in that revolutionary work. And so, for instance, if we were to take the time to read Matthew chapter 2 from the perspective of an outsider, several things will stick out to our minds. For instance, we might notice how um, outsiders and unlikely people and those without much social standing in Jesus' world, in Matthew's world, in the world of the early church, those are the people who take uh, center place in this story, acting in all sorts of subversive and surprising ways. We've talked about it before, but it's the Magi who in Matthew's Gospel are the first to come and worship Jesus. It is clear as they go to Jerusalem to talk to Herod that he consults with the wise men and the wise men in Jerusalem, the leaders and the, the religious leaders and the scholars, they all know about this prophecy concerning Bethlehem and the Messiah, but yet they're not the ones searching for Jesus to give honor and homage to him. It is uh, these Gentile, these pagan, these Persian wizards that have come from far off in the east to come and search out the Messiah. They're the very first ones to find Jesus in Matthew's gospel. They're the very first ones to bow down before him as the Messiah. They're the very first ones to acknowledge him as such. In the world that Jesus lived in, in the world that Matthew lived in, and the early church lived in, it was not those on the inside, those who had it all together, those who knew all the rules, those who were the uh, quote-unquote people of God who got it right. It was those on the outside that got it right. Those on the outside that God was giving his concern to, those on the outside who had the door open for them to come to the Messiah over against, in spite of um, what those on the inside had to say. Or we might notice the role in Matthew chapter 2 that Egypt plays. Of course, if you've been reading the Bible for any length of time at all, you kind of know what's going on whenever Egypt comes up. And it doesn't hurt that uh, Matthew will be setting up his story as he goes along as a new Exodus story. And as soon as you think of Exodus, you think of Egypt. And as soon as you think of Egypt, you think of bad guys. They are the ones who are established. They are the ones who are the powerful. Those They are the ones who do the oppressing but Matthew does surprising things with Egypt in this story. It is uh, God's people who are powerful in Matthew's story. It is God's people who are established in Matthew's story. It is God's people who do the oppressing. It is the king. And a term for the king would have been the son of God. The Messiah is the one in the story who is oppressing the people that he was meant to rule over the people that he was meant to work for the flourish, flourishing of, the people that he was meant to represent God's goodness to and, and help nourish God's goodness in their lives. It is the king who is causing the darkness from which they cry out as he, in Matthew chapter 2, slaughters all of those innocent children. And in a great reversal, it is um, to Egypt that Joseph and Mary and Jesus flee to safety. It is those who are hated, those who are despised, those who are on the outside, those who don't belong, those who are no part of what God is doing in the world in which the Messiah, the young son of God, the son of God, finds refuge. There's only danger amongst those who are in the know and those on the inside, those who are the righteous and the faithful. There is refuge among those that are hated and despised, maligned. And so we see again and again and again this, this great reversal going on. 
where those on the outside are given surprising roles to play, those who we wouldn't think twice about are giving surprising roles to play, those who have no cultural influence or power or look down upon. They are the ones taking the center stage. It is the pagan wizards and the Egyptians, the hated Egyptians that play central roles in this story as far as finding God's favor. And it is those on the inside, the religious leaders and the king and those in Jerusalem who sided with the king that turn against God. And of course, in reading all of this at some point, I hope what we realize is that as, as we read this, we are the ones on the inside. We are the ones who are comfortable, who can afford to come to Christmas with an air of sentiment and warmth and fuzziness. We are the ones who can ignore all of the subversive messages in the Christmas story in favor of, oh, look, it's a sweet baby, you know. We are among the most wealthy people on earth. We are among the most powerful people on earth. We are among the most privileged people on earth. We are as it goes, the ones who would gather on Sunday morning. We are the ultimate in the story of Matthew, insiders in this story. And as we wrestle with our own insider status, perhaps, hopefully, we begin to ask questions about what it means for God to set aside the insiders in this story for the sake of the outsiders. What does it mean to have a God that gives such attention to the outsiders, who gives such care and concern to the outsiders that he would tell this story in this way? Because certainly he could have told it any way he wanted to. It didn't have to be the pagan wizards. It didn't have to be Egypt. Herod could have been the good guy. Jesus could have been born into Herod's family. So what is God teaching us? And as insiders, how might we find ourselves in the insiders of Matthew chapter 2? How might we find ways to avoid being as the insiders when we look at the insiders of Matthew chapter 2? How are we already like Herod? How does Herod warn us to be different than he was and this is a theme that's going to run throughout all of the gospels not least the gospel we're going to spend the most of our time in this year in the gospel of mark and how would god have us relate to those outsiders because if you come from the position i'm used to looking at it in this is a story about a couple of guys who show up after a cool star appears in the sky that we can go out and photograph and they give jesus gifts as the king that he rightfully is and then we skip ahead oftentimes to the rest of the story starting in Matthew chapter 3. But if you find yourself on the bottom of the pile, if you find yourself somewhere less comfortable than my position, if you find yourself less privileged than my position, if you find yourself somewhere less secure than my position, this is a powerful, subversive, beautiful, earth-shattering story where God sees those who have no place in the kingdom of God and makes room for them in the kingdom of God. Makes room for them within the story of what he is doing in the world. There's the outsiders coming in. That's what this story is about. It's the great reversal. And it serves as a great challenge for us to make sure that we're not the insiders that Jesus or God rather condemns in this story and to make sure that we welcome the outsiders as God does in this story. Because if Matthew chapter 2 teaches us anything read from that perspective, it is that God cares for those who aren't like us. Those who don't look like us or live like us or have values like us. Those who don't vote like us or spend like us or live in neighborhoods like ours. Those whose skin color is different, whose jobs are, are different, whose ways of looking at the world are different. God loves those people too. The gospel is for them too. And Jesus being born ought to be good news for them too. And so unless this Christmas story we tell is, is good news for our homeless neighbors or our 
immigrant neighbors, whether they have documentation or not, or for our gay and lesbian neighbors, or our African American neighbors, or our poor neighbors, or our Republican neighbors, or our Democrat neighbors, any of their neighbors. It's not really the story that God was telling. And so this week I want to just ask you to wrestle with the God who reveals himself in this story, who could have told the story any way he wanted to, but this was the way that he told it. This was the way that he decided to bring Jesus into the world, and in doing that he tells us something about himself. Wrestle with that God. Try to set yourself at the bottom of the pile, someone who has no cultural power, someone who has no innate comfort, someone who has no privilege, and, and read the story from their perspective. What do we learn about God, and how does that change our life? I'm going to pray for you, and then I'm going to ask you to pray with me, and uh, then we're going to call it a day. I hope you guys have a good week. Father, we pray that you would open our eyes to humbly read your story in ways that are not native to us. To ask ourselves how this story might read from others, what we in our blind spots might miss. And as we read the story in such a way, we ask that you would grant us the courage to follow you as you are revealed in the story. Not that all the observations we have made previously are wrong, but it's only one set of facts, and you are bigger than that one perspective. God, grant us the courage to faithfully and fearlessly be yours. And we come together now and we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one for yours. It's the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Church, we love you and we miss you. We hope to see you again soon. Um, we're pulling for you way over here. You guys have a great week.